Hi everyone, and in this mini lecture I'm going to be talking about postmodernism in popular culture. Uh, this lecture is to attempt to try to get our heads around postmodernism. It's a very complicated, weird, strange, and sometimes extremely easy concept to get. Um, and it has a lot to do particularly with modern popular culture, or postmodern popular culture as, as the case were. So, postmodernism is a movement that we see emerge in the the mid mid nineteenth uh, mid twentieth century, and still holds a lot of uh, influence in the world today, or influence in in how we explore objects today. And at its cornerstone is it aims to understand how powerful a role that mass media and popular culture have taken on in the twentieth and twenty first century. Uh, but it doesn't do this in necessarily the traditional ways that um, we've seen with other theories. And so again, taking from Dominic Strinati, mass media and popular culture are the most important and powerful institutions and control and shape all other types of social relationships. Uh, in this digital age, right, so this was written in 1995, in this digital age where uh, we are all of us, or, or many of us, are very much invested or negotiate our lives in many ways through things like social media. Um, there's an even there's an added layer of of this that I think is worth noting. So, what's at the cornerstone of this, and the reason why mass media and popular culture are so considered so valuable in postmodern concepts, is that we define ourselves based upon signs and symbols we're exposed to from popular culture. That is, we're a reflection of our reflection. And when you think about it, you know, if we understand pop culture reflects people, and we ourselves gain our own sense of identity from popular culture, from the stories we're exposed to, the myths we're exposed to, the concepts, the, the ideas about gender, race, sexuality, all of these different things are often strongly informed or, or our experience with these are strongly informed by popular culture, right? Yes, we, we get the birds and the bees talk from our parents maybe, or from somebody in school, but we also learn a whole lot about, you know, our sex and sexuality from a variety of TV shows, a variety of stories that we read growing up. So that within this, it, it, you know, the postmodernist viewpoint is, wow, you know, so much of what we do is actually not really isn't entirely driven by ourselves, but is driven by this by how we understand or experience the culture or the popular culture around us. So one of the big ideas about this or th that centers on this is the idea is that consumption is equally important as production. This is a big change in how it, among uh, pop culture theorists is that consumption, buying and consuming things becomes equally as pivotal as production. And this is captured probably best in uh, one of Bush's post 9-11 speeches where, you know, he doesn't, after after the towers have come down, his, his argument, his point is to go to the malls, to go shopping, to not stop being a consumer. And so there's this interesting element in our culture where consuming or consumption is becoming equally important as production. And so what does that mean for our lives? What does it mean that, you know, it is equally important to consume as it is to produce? Well, one of the things that we see is that, you know, these, these ways of existing within culture come from consumption in popular culture. Um, that really, in this day and age, it is hard to be actually part of American culture without being a significant consumer. Think about all of these things, right? Dating is largely an act, a continual act of consumption. Now, I'm not saying you can't date somebody and, and not spend money, but try to. And how much flack do you come up with? How much pressure is there to be spending money? You know, you've got the dinner and the movie. You've got dates that often entail direct spending of money never mind indirect spending of money such as making sure you have a car or that uh, you have some modes of transportation that are paid for making sure that you know you provide some means of, of food that you have some clothing that is of appeal to the other person things like that we become we start to have of course holidays that are around consumption 
Never mind Thanksgiving. It's all about Black Friday, right? At this point, Black Fr Thanksgiving is getting in the way of Black Friday uh, with companies or, or, or stores opening up on Thanksgiving. So we start to, it becomes a central piece of our culture. Even employment, in order to make money, there's a variety of things you have to buy, or there's a variety of things you have to consume. Increasingly, you need, you know, you need to consume a college education. You need to consume a, or purchase, or have certain types of clothing for certain types of jobs. You need to maintain certain physical appearances. You can't necessarily come into certain jobs looking, you know, completely disheveled. And then at other, in certain jobs, you also need to keep up certain social appearances. You need to, you know, be part of certain groups in order to be seen as functioning within that profession. So all of these are, are methods of consumption that go hand in hand with our identity and our ability to function within culture. So within popular culture, uh, within postmodernism, one of the things that, that comes to, to dominate is surface and style. Um, there's an element of critique embedded in with this, but there's also an element of curiosity. A uh, good example of surface and style is that idea of planned obsolescence, that idea of, you know, we can, or, or purposely having things that are going to be obsolete in a period of time. Fashion is a great example, um, but so are our goods. Again, IKEA is an example of planned obsolescence where many of the things are expected to only purposely work to a certain time. They could last much longer, but they don't, you know, the, the producers don't want that. It's very much about just getting things, consuming them, and moving on. And in that, we, we privilege style over function. And this is very true in our society. We rather care about, you know, the aesthetics than we do how long is it going to last. Um, and this is something postmodernists will explore and look at and really kind of play around with. And there are some interesting things you can do with that, certainly. So, again, examples of form over function, sagging pants, elaborate or innate shoes, right? I know, I know many women who wear these innate shoes who at the end of the day, their feet are ex they're in excruciating pain. And the question is why? Why would you subject yourself to that over a pair of shoes that are comfortable and allow you to move about freely? SUVs are another example of you know, style over function. Realistically, most people do not need an SUV, but there's a you know the style of it is what attracts um, over the actual function. So the big difference here between say postmodernist theory and, and mass culture theory is that mass culture theory is scared of this. Postmodernists are intrigued with it. They are curious to explore these relationships and how people negotiate those identities. How does a woman negotiate her identity of ornate shoes that are uncomfortable with with you know her day-to-day -day life how does that fit into her being part of the culture um, the other thing we have to we see within postmodernism is that meta narratives become less domineering or relevant well of course then the question is what the hell's a meta narrative and these are theories that attempt to explain the course of history putting all narratives into one large narrative so in our modern world, this one great story that explains everything becomes less and less possible. Because we recognize, because we live in a relativistic world and, and that we recognize you know, how people form is extremely different from one another. There's some similarities, but there's a lot of difference in how people come to find themselves, how they come to find their identity or identities. The big thing, of course, becomes in this relativistic world, there are absolutely no absolutes. And of course, that statement itself is a, is a, certain, there's a certain amount of hypocrisy in it because it is an absolute statement. So there is this kind of contradictive element that permeates within post, postmodernism. And with that, we talk about the rise of the multi-self. Um, that what we see is comp competing identities rise in a lack of a meta narrative. That since we don't have this one large, clear narrative about who we are and what we are, we start to get competing identities or competing narratives about who and what we are. And this changes again according to setting and context. In some settings, I am an instructor. I am an instructional designer. In other settings, I'm a runner. I'm a student. I am a 
uh, I'm a cat owner. And these start to, we see these more, these come to more mix together and make for what we would consider a multi-self. And so what we find is, you know, maintaining multiple identities, roles, and self, um, self-perceptions, right? That we're continually doing this. We're, identi- we're, we're trying to maintain what our sense of self is. We're trying to maintain certain identities. And again, this, comes, this is very true as we look at the internet, as we look at social media. And there's the self that we present on Facebook, but is that the same self as we present here um, when, we're in, when we're face-to-face with somebody? We also start to see there's this flexibility in time, space, bodies, and minds, right? As we start to have, of course, you know, this digital life, this life online where we interact with people and have a persona, um, time and space becomes different. And we also see time, space, bodies, and mind differently. How we experience them or how we interact with one another. So if you haven't gotten the sense yet, I mean, the, the main thing or, or one of the major themes within postmodernism is that we're on unstable grounding. And in fact, instability is the new stability is, is a way to think of it. Um, that we experience incohesion of time and space. What does it mean now that I can call upon so much, so many different things online? I can interact with so many different people online. I can talk to somebody on the other side of the world when in previous times that was impossible. It, w- it could take a year for me to correspond just back and forth once with somebody across the world. Right? That makes for a world that's much, much less stable. It feels a little strange to be able to literally div- you know, break through space and time to encounter and talk and interact with one another. Um, that things happen increasingly faster. And we see this, of course, with memes. Um, we see this, of course, you know, as news breaks and how quickly it shows up and then how quickly it disappears, right? Uh, pre- you know, the, if you look at a per- variety of news stories that came and went, they went so fast, even though they were sometimes really important things. Um, and so this, th- this idea of things happening faster makes us feel a little bit unstable. Uh, and we have trouble answering the question, where are you from, right? At the beginning of this class, I asked you, you know, where are you from? Now, what does that mean? Does that mean where are you, your family from? Does that mean where are you from right now? Does that mean where, you know, where, do you, where did your ancestors originate from? Um, where are you from today could be different from where are you from three weeks ago. Right? You could have moved in that interim. So it becomes increasingly hard to answer those questions. And then it also becomes increasingly hard because there's so much fluctuation around, there's so much movement in the world. Um, is somebody who is here, is somebody who is here that has lived in, in England, but whose family is from India, where do they say they're from? That's a really interesting, hard concept to wrap, wrap one's head around. And then we live in a world of uncertain realities. I think the best example of this is, of course, uh, the ways in which President Obama has been depicted. It's interesting to note that there's still a large population of people that believes he's a Muslim, he's not a citizen, or he's a socialist, even though there's evidence otherwise. In a postmodern society, because so much is... So much is so much of our identity is formed by the kinds of media, the kinds of information, the kinds of places we go to engage with, then we also end up with, if those places have different types of realities, then people experience things different. It's not clear, Um, which is fascinating because even though there is evidence, there's still a large portion of people that don't believe certain facts. And so we get into that realm, and we see that with things like the environment and that the idea around global climate change. 97% of scientists believe global climate change is real and that it's, it's being largely created or generated by human, interact, by human activity. And yet there's still many people who refuse to believe that because they've read this report or they've, you know, they, they watched this news, this news piece. Um, so we get into a world of uncertain realities. And as I said, instability is the new stability. So that's postmodernism. It's, it's a little bit all over the place and that's essentially part of what postmodernism modern, modernism is, is it, it is a little bit all over the place. 
Um, but the idea is that it really does look at and um, explore that sh that strong relationship between popular culture and identity and how they kind of mirror one another and create many different types of experiences and identities. So that's all for now. Thank you very much for watching and I will see you in the next video.